welcome. It is my great privilege to be welcoming you to this event on behalf of META, the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization, apropos the publication of the Greek translation of Guy Standing's book, Basic Income, and how we can make it happen. Uh, by the way, the book itself is gracefully perched, at, perched atop that table over there, and uh, you can procure it if you are so inclined, and you should be so inclined. There will be the opportunity for book signing after the event. With us today is, of course, the author of the book, Professor Guy Standing, who is currently Professorial Research Associate at the School uh, of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, and Honorary Co-President of the Basic Income Earth Network, BN. For those among this Athenian audience who think that they don't know Professor Guy Standing, please think again. You'll surely have heard the term precariat, a topic that's now more timely than ever, and a term that was popularized by Professor Guy Standing's uh, book 10 years ago, The Precariat, The New Dangerous Class. It goes without saying that the emergence of the precariat and the urgent calls for universal basic income are anything but unrelated themes. Also with us today is Professor Yanis Varoufakis, leader of the Parliamentary Party Mera 25 and Professor of Economic Theory at the University of Athens, who also has written the foreword to the Greek edition of the book. Professor Varoufakis hardly needs more introductions to an Athenian audience, otherwise I would be carrying calls to Newcastle or owls to Athens. This you shall be spared. We are very thankful to both Guy and Yanis uh, for their presence here. Now, uh, Professor Guy Standing will begin with a brief introduction to the book and to basic income in general. Uh, this will be followed by a response by uh, Professor Yanis Varoufakis, a minimally moderated discussion as well. Um, there I prophesize that the not so subtle difference between basic income and basic dividend shall make an appearance in this discussion. And after this, mirabile auditu, uh, the floor will be yours uh, for questions from the audience. Yet, there is a caveat. These questions will have to be magnificently succinct so that more people will have the chance to participate in the discussion. Let us begin. Professor Standing, again, thank you very much for your presence here. The floor is yours. <clears throat> thank you very much. And first of all, I should apologize for having to speak in English. I hope you can all hear me and follow my English. It's a great pleasure to be back in Greece. I first came here as a student, and I can say that with a certain sense of pride that I was actually imprisoned on one of my early visits to Greece for opposing Papadopoulos and the colonels, and I learned Sataki in prison. So I have some affinity with Greece. Now what I want to do in my few moments of introduction is say that while I've been promoting and advocating a basic income for over 30 years, when the pandemic struck early in 2020, something happened. Around the world, millions of people have become interested in basic income, and a huge number of people have been convinced that it is now an imperative rather than a desirable policy. Extraordinarily, I've given over 400 Zoom presentations in 40 countries. And one time I asked how many people in Korea are listening to this presentation by this obscure professor about basic income. And they said, we will tell you tomorrow. And tomorrow, the next day, they came back to me and said 600,000 people had attended those presentations. That is a sea change in what has been taking place in the discourse. And while I want to thank Yanis in particular for his forward and for his courage politically, I genuinely believe there's a political energy out there which is waiting to be tapped by a new progressive politics. We're not seeing it in our politicians, certainly not in my own country, where the left is tearing itself apart, but out there the young 
women in particular, minorities everywhere, are converting to a new progressive agenda with a new vocabulary. And basic income is part of that. And as I argue in the book, fundamentally the justification for a basic income is ethical, not instrumental. The ethical justification is something that should guide all of us in progressive thinking. And the pandemic has added to that by saying that not only is it an ethical, desirable type of policy, but it's become an economic imperative, as I will mention in a few moments. Now, the ethical justification is threefold. First, it is a matter of common justice. In 1217, in Westminster Abbey, the regent and a cardinal representing the Pope put their seal on two constitutional documents that have defined Western-style democracies ever since. And it was the second one, the other one being the Magna Carta, the second one which was the Charter of the Forests. And the Charter of the Forests said that every individual, every free person has a right to subsistence in the commons. And the commons are the property that in Justinian law belongs to everybody. It includes the air, the land, the sea, the minerals, and the amenities and social facilities that we inherit, that have been built up by our ancestors. And if you allow the private inheritance of private riches, which if I'm not mistaken is a lot of something for nothing, the gained by a minority, then think of a basic income as a common dividend on our collective wealth. A return that says that your ancestors, my ancestors contributed to our wealth, but we don't know who has contributed more or less, and therefore we should have an equal basic share. That for me is a fundamental justification for a basic income. The income and wealth of every single one of us sitting here is far more to do with the efforts and achievements of our ancestors than anything we do ourselves. And we should be humble enough to accept that. For me, that is fundamental. But it is also a matter if you are religious. I am not religious, but many people still are. It's a matter of religious justice. God gave us unequal talents. And we don't all have the ability to make money. And as a matter of religious justice, it, a basic income is a compensation for those who don't have the competence or whatever it is to make money. I was delighted last year that the Pope, I'm hardly a Catholic, but the Pope came out in favor of basic income. And he gave a good justification that was not actually religious, it was about common justice. It's also a matter of ecological justice. It's the rich that create the pollution. It's the poor that pay the price in bad health, bad living conditions, and so on. So, to take from the wealthy to give to the poor is a way of ecologically helping. There are other aspects of justice, compassionate justice. A basic income is a right, an economic right. It's not an act of charity. It's not means tested. It's not behavior tested. It's not a matter of pity. It's a right. And in that regard, those of you who are not familiar with the concept of basic income, let me say what it is we want to fight for. We want to fight for every individual 
man and woman equally with a smaller amount paid to children should receive a monthly, a modest amount without conditions, without means tests, without con behavior tests. It's a right. And it's non-withdrawable as a right. The second ethical justification which I develop at length in the book is that it would enhance freedom. It would enhance three types of freedom. It would enhance what some people call libertarian freedom, the freedom to choose, the freedom to say no to an oppressive parent or landlord or employer. We have done pilots around the world and one of the most dramatic findings of every single pilot as it has enabled women, in particular, to say no when they don't want to put up with abusive relationships or exploitative relationships. The emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value, a theme I develop in the books. The second type of freedom a basic income would enhance is what some people call liberal freedom the freedom to be moral. You can only be moral if you can make a decision of your own volition, your own decisions. If a bureaucrat or a landlord or an employer tells you you must do X and Y, that's not freedom. It's not moral freedom. You can only do it if you can make the decision yourself. And that leads to the third type of freedom which is most important for those of us on the left, which is Republican freedom. The freedom from potential domination. It's not freedom for a woman if she has to ask her husband or her father or her partner if she can do X, Y, and Z, even if she knows that 99% of the time he will say yes. It's only freedom if she can make that decision herself without having to bow to any figure of authority. Those three types of freedom are not advanced by most social policies. And those of us on the left have to look back on the last century and recognize and look in the mirror and say we have failed on advancing freedoms as much as we should have done. And the third ethical justification is that a basic income, even if it's less than subsistence and only a modest amount, gives people a sense of basic security. Basic security is a human need. It is also a public good in the sense that if you have basic security, it doesn't deprive me of basic security. And if we all have basic security, the value to everybody goes up. We have seen that in communities where we've done basic income, the sense of security increases. And what psychologists have taught us is those people who are facing insecurity suffer a diminishing mental IQ. The mental bandwidth shrinks. And therefore, it is not acceptable to say that people have to behave responsibly if they're living in chronic insecurity. And that leads to my final few comments. I may have taken longer than I should. Uh, thank you for allowing me. Which is the economic imperative. Today, we're living in a transformational moment of crisis where neoliberalism has bred rentier capitalism. In one of the books, I have a few copies available, I've argued that we have moved beyond the neoliberal age into an age of rentier capitalism in which more and more of the income flows to the owners of property, physical, financial, intellectual. And in the process, the functional distribution of income is getting worse and worse and worse. And there are no policies reversing that. And we have a new class structure that's emerging with the precariat, the main mass class, people living in chronic insecurity, on the edge of debt, 
living bits and pieces lives, looking for a new politics. And what I've done is say, recalling from William Beveridge. Some of you may know that William Beveridge wrote a famous report in 1942, which shaped the welfare states after the Second World War. And in his report, on page two, he said, our challenge is to slay, to kill, five giants. The giants of disease, idleness, ignorance, squalor, and want. We haven't killed those five giants, but today we are confronted with eight modern giants. And progressive politics has to challenge and weaken all of those eight giants. I don't have time to go into all of them, but I will merely mention them chronologically or whatever. Inequality is a giant. If basic income is designed properly, it can help reduce inequality. Insecurity is a pandemic even before COVID struck us. Millions and millions of people are living in chronic insecurity, and that chronic insecurity is fundamentally about uncertainty, unknown unknowns that could strike any of us at any stage. The third giant is debt. What made the pandemic so much worse last year than the Spanish flu 100 years before was that private debt, corporate debt, and public debt were all much, much higher than they had been at that time. We have a fragile economy. Debt is a curse for millions and millions of people. And that leads to the fourth giant. Before COVID, we had a pandemic of stress. Stress which is leading to deaths of despair, suicides, rising morbidity, social illnesses, use of opioids. We need a strategy for reducing stress. The fifth giant is precarity. And precarity doesn't mean the same as insecurity. Precarity means you have to ask for favors from everybody. Bureaucrats, landlords, employers, parents, you are a supplicant. We need to reverse that. The sixth giant are the robots. I get invited to Silicon Valley to talk about this subject, and they think the robots are going to remove all our activities. I don't believe that. But what I do believe is the technological revolution is worsening inequality, worsening insecurities, and is more disruptive. But it's the seventh giant which I think is going to prove decisive in mobilizing those millions of people in favor of basic income. And that is the threat of extinction. The ecological crisis is rushing towards us. We have global warming, we have pollution, you know it here in Athens better than in most places, but it's all over the world. And the young want a future. And that is why millions of them are attracted to basic income, because basic income means we can afford high carbon taxes, we can afford high eco taxes, which will only be possible if you recycle the revenue raised in a form of a common dividend or a basic income. And a basic income will also help us slow down. It will strengthen the desire to do care work, unpaid care work. We go through our lives wishing we had spent more time looking after our mother, our father, our children. If you have basic income, you don't chase, chase, jobs, jobs, jobs. You can spend more time in care. And that is ecologically what we should be doing. And the final point is this, the eighth giant is the threat of neo-fascist populism. We were very fortunate in one respect that bloody Trump was not re-elected because of COVID. It's a sad reflection on reality, but he would have been re-elected. We got away with it just. But there are other Trumps waiting 
to play on the fears of people who are insecure, fears of people who don't have a future. We need a progressive politics far more desperately today than ever before if we are going to defeat the threat of neo-fascist populism. I urge all of you to think positive. We can afford it. It won't reduce work. There are the objections I dealt with in the book are prejudices, not real objections. But I urge all of us to think more constructively about how we give income security to everybody. And that's what it's all about. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Standing. And now we all look forward to Yanis Varoufakis' response and comments. Uh, thank you, Sotiri. I could be listening to guys standing for another three hours, go on and on. Um, it's a very rare experience for me to be sitting and listening and not finding a word with which to disagree. Um, I have to look into it. Uh, let me, before making a few comments by which to warm you up for the conversation that will follow, uh, thank the Numismatic Museum for um, making the space available for us. META, our um, Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization. Um, by the way, let me remind you that META is not just meant literally as in after, it's meant as beyond, and I can think of no better way of thinking of beyond that which we have, the status quo, than Guy Standing's book presentation. A few thoughts, nothing comprehensive, nothing well-structured, just thoughts that um, may you know, lead you to pose questions that uh, Guy Standing will want to answer. The fundamental fallacy that we live under and we have lived under for centuries is that wealth is produced privately and then appropriated by the state for the purposes of taxation from the privateers that produce it. This is a fundamental error which is functional to the interests of the rulers. Wealth has always been produced socially, not privately. From day one, when we first got together, formed a band of hunters and went out there to catch deer or rabbits or whatever, production has been socially based. And then what happened was the strong, the powerful, the well-organized, privatized, the social surplus, which was produced socially. Capitalism simply turbocharged that process and moreover hid very meticulously this fallacy. So even exploited workers have come to feel that, you know, in some way, Everybody gets what they deserve, however unfair, however exploitative the distribution of the loot between those who produced it collectively may be. And this is the heart of universal basic income. What it does, and you heard Guy Standing do this brilliantly, it challenges the fallacy. He says, no, wealth is not produced by Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos in proportion to the, to the wealth that they have amassed. And then the state comes in and says, for the purposes of social justice, I'm going to take some billions or millions of you know, uh, dollars and cents from you rich guys, and I'm going to give it to the poor people because they're deserving poor, or maybe we don't like to watch them die on the street. No, what Guy Standing's philosophy undermines is precisely this notion that 
people get what they deserve, and then everything else is an add-on. Layers of fairness overlaid on top of an already just distribution that um, reflects individual entrepreneurship, effort, parsimony, and so on. The problem with the universal, universal basic income, like the problem with any good idea that has a progressive potential, is that the right, the forces of regression have appropriated it, and at times they have championed it. So it was Milton Friedman, for instance, who championed universal basic income. But why did he champion universal basic income? Because he wanted to wreck the welfare state. In 2015, during um, Nikos Theoharakis and I were in these negotiations with the Troika, Guy, you probably don't know that, but they were insisting upon not a universal basic income, but they called it a minimum income, right? And chastising us for not adopting their idea that every Greek should have the right to a minimum income. Now, if you looked at the, um, uh, the small print, what they wanted to do was to do away with child benefit, uh, disability benefit, all the benefits that allow some people to survive and to replace it with a minuscule minimum income. So, one enemy of um, the idea of a universal basic income is this. It is the, its appropriation by those who want to use it against its core, its essence what it really was meant to be about. The second enemy is um, what Guy Standing refers to laborism. But I'm not going to, he can speak about it. I'll be a bit more brutal in the way I will explain it. Um, I've ceased being an academic six years ago, so I can afford to do that. You're still an academic, so you have to be refined. The problem is the social democratic left and parts of the broader left. Why? Because following a good instinct that the right has tried to use a universal basic income in order to destroy what the social democratic left or left has succeeded in doing since beverage with a welfare state, they go to their own conclusion that UBI, universal basic income, is a threat to the very project of the left and also to the ethos, the morality, of the left, the idea of something for nothing. I have heard that expression, something for nothing, from trades unionists, from comrades, from fellow economists, some very good friends of ours say that, in, a, you know, in opposition to universal basic income. Um, that's the second, I'm, I don't want to give a lecture on this, just flagging it, maybe a guy can take this further later on. Uh, the third impediment to universal basic income is the question of how is it going to be paid for. And here, I don't know whether we have an agreement or a disagreement with, with Guy, it will be interesting to bring this out. When our movement, DiEM25, across Europe, we, I don't know whether you know that, but in May 2019, we ran across Europe with one manifesto which included what we call the universal basic dividend, by which to make the point that we were not proposing a universal basic income that was paid for by the taxes of the poor. Because let's face it, most taxes are paid by the poor. The rich do not pay taxes. They have fantastic ways and very complicated schemas by which to avoid paying tax. <laughs> so when you say to people, oh, we're going to give a universal basic income to everyone, and they say, what, to drug addicts, to surfers, to layabouts, to the lazy, and you say, yes. Because as Guy said, we do not distinguish, for instance, when it comes to giving the vote to people on the basis of merit, everybody has the vote. Similarly, we do not distinguish on the basis of merit who gets a universal basic income. But the moment the hard-working proletarian, precariat, whatever, who is sitting after 10 hours at work, who can't make ends meet, hears on the telly, on the television, on the shit box, excuse me, that um, we are going to tax them to give money to layabouts, we lose the plot. 
This is why our movement and our party has uh, made it clear. A universal basic income that is sizable, but which is not paid for by taxation, it is paid for by returns to capital. We have a whole elaborate explanation of what that means. And now, and Guy Standing made that point very clearly and well, now with the pandemic, uh, there isn't even a discussion of the money tree. We socialists, you know, whenever we say something, the right points a finger and says, oh, you've discovered the money tree again, have you? Well, the answer is, no, we didn't, you did. It's called the central bank, it's called quantitative easing, okay? They've printed 10 trillion US dollars since the beginning of the pandemic, 10 trillion US dollars since the beginning of the pandemic to give to their mates. Commercial banks who then give it to Apple, to Google, and so on, and they, what, you know what they do with that money. They don't invest it, they go to the stock exchange, and Google buys Google shares, Apple buys Apple shares, so you have this decoupling of the financial sphere from capitalism, <laughs> from really existing capitalism. Um, so my, my personal line, and this, and you, a week ago I was presenting my own book here, another now, which is a, a, a fictional tale of what could have been. Um, you know, why not have a digital bank account for everybody with our central bank? And the central bank simply puts a certain amount of money, it prints it and puts it in there every month. It would be even, it would be less than what they're already, already producing out of the money tree that is operating today. I will close and wait for Guy's uh, response and also for your questions by saying that Universal basic income is not about replacing the existing social welfare state. It is not about civilizing capitalism. Let us be clear about this. It is time to be radical. Universal basic income is the first move towards overthrowing capitalism, towards giving everyone the right to say no. And this is not a libertarian right, Guy. This is maybe a, a, a small distinction that I want to make. The libertarian right is the right to say yes. You know, I give you, I make you an offer, right? That you can't refuse because you're starving. So, you know, I'm going to fire you. And the offer I'm going to give you is that you're going to become my associate. So I'm going to pay you a pittance like it's happening with if food as we speak or deliveroo and so on. And you, you can say yes. You know, it's like I point a gun at you and you can say yes, you will give me your wallet. This is the libertarian freedom. The progressive freedom is to, the freedom to say no, and Guy made this point very well. And, but to say no, you need, you need to have options. The reason why the right embraces the social democratic left's opposition to UBI, to universal basic income, to fight universal basic income, is because they know that it undermines their power, power to extract and to exploit, it undermines capitalism. Sorry for speaking too long, Guy. Thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, in view of the fact that you kept notes, is my premonition right that you would want to respond to the response, Guy? Or should we open uh, the floor? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let me... Maybe you can hold it. No, that's okay. You can all hear me, I hear. Uh, I feel that we should have questions and response, but let me just uh, thank Yanis for his comments. I genuinely believe the libertarian perspective, which Yanis mentioned, is easy to defeat. It's a minimalist state that makes no sense to anybody with common sense. I'm more worried about the opposition from social democrats who defend laborism. I've written extensively about that in my other books. They are the most conservative with a small c and reactionary. They want to bring back yesterday, the trente glorieuse or whatever they wish to call it, the golden years of capitalism. It won't happen, it's impossible but it's also fundamentally regressive. The social democratic progressive era at the beginning of the 20th century was a progressive move. 
Let's accept that. It was a huge progressive move. But it ceased to be that after the Second World War because it entrenched male breadwinners. It was always sexist. It was always paternalistic. It was always protecting us. And fundamentally, it has never been ecological. If any social democrat or trade union gets confronted with a choice between the environment or jobs, they go for jobs. We need a different perspective, but we need to bring them with us and convince them somehow that liberal freedom matters and that actually laborism is holding us back. And that's why the precariat, the young precariat, are not listening to the social democrats today. They are rejecting them. They don't support the old labor unions. I support unions per se, but not the existing labor unions. We need unions. We need collective voice. Of course we do on the left. So I agree with Yanis's point entirely, and I've tried to write about it. But as when it comes to funding a basic income, I believe that while it's no panacea, it's got to be combined with other policies, we have to be on the road towards having a basic income as an anchor of a new income distribution system. And in my book, Plunder of the Commons, I basically said we should build commons capital funds from which to pay out gradually rising common dividends. So we need tax reform. So instead of taxing, as Yanis eloquently put it, taxing the poor, taxing people who rely on earned incomes, we have to tax wealth. We have to tax the people who are taking our commons. We have to tax the people who are polluting. And that, I think, is the long-term way of paying for it. But to reiterate a point, don't forget that with quantitative easing after the financial crash, they gave the banks and financiers billions of pounds, euros, dollars. And we did calculations showing that if they'd used just a fraction of that money, they could have given everybody in Europe a modest basic income. It wasn't an impossibility. But I believe in long term we have to build up capital funds. And the last point I want to make with regard to Yanis's point is Milton Friedman was not a libertarian in the modern sense. He believed that a negative income tax would enable people to be better consumers and producers because they would then have a base on which to make decisions. I don't think he believed in dismantling all the welfare state. These crazy libertarians do, and we must oppose them. But as I say, I think they're easy game relative to the Social Democrats. So thank you very much for the comments. I apologize for the omission. Uh, as uh, META, the Center for Post-Capitalist Civilization, we are indeed very grateful for the gracious hospitality of the Numismatic Museum of Athens today. And now I shall take delight in abusing the very limited power I have as moderator by asking the first question, if I may. Um, spoiler alert, having read the book, I know that there have been pilot applications of forms of basic income in many, many countries. Could you give us a glimpse of how this went? Sorry, <coughs> Sorry to take the floor yet again, <laughs> but you're listening to a crazy man, a man who has had the stupidity to design and conduct basic income experiments in countries in four continents. Not many people get a chance to test out a policy that they believe in, in the course of their lives. And if I can just briefly summarize the findings from all of those pilots in India, in Africa, in North America, in Brazil, in Finland, and so on, 
The biggest single thing that comes out when you have a basic income is improvement of mental and physical health. This is a universal finding. It shouldn't be surprising, but it makes a huge difference, and that has a feedback effect on reducing the demands on public health services, so it actually starts reducing the need for public spending elsewhere. But we've also found improvements in schooling, improvements in school attendance, improvements in nutrition, improvements in women's status. That's the one finding that comes across everywhere. At the end of our biggest experiment in India, we asked people, who do you think benefited more, men or women? And vast majorities of both the men and the women said the women. And it is this sense of liberation. If I may just tell you a short story. We did a pilot in Namibia. And at the end of the two years, I went to one of the villages and I called some young women across, teenage women. And I said, please, can you tell me what is the best thing for you of having had a basic income in this time? They were nervous, foreigner, they were young, etc. giggled. But then one of them had the courage and she said, I'll tell you why. Before, when the men came down from the fields at the end of the month with their money in their pocket, we had to say yes. With our basic income, we can say no. That's emancipation. And it's powerful because women in other experiments have been moving out of abusive relationships because they have some financial independence. It's a universal feeling. If you have some security, you take control. It's not difficult to understand. But for me, those little things are so important. Thank you very much. Now the floor is open for questions, very brief questions if possible, so that we may have more of them. I pray that a flying micro uh, mic materializes. Splendid. Kriton Arsenis, our MP, please. Thank you very much. Yanis uh, said that we should be radical, so I would like to ask, would basic income be best coupled with an income cap? Uh, sorry, wait for the Microsoft. The microphone. Where are you going? Microsoft. The microphone to arrive. Oops. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, two questions. The first is what do you think it should be the appropriate process, democratic process, I mean, to decide the level of uh, the basic income? And the second question is uh, some 30 odd years ago, you did some stern work on labor market flexibility, and there was a number in the 90s of. Uh, uh, country studies in the ILO regarding the, the same thing. Uh, how do you uh, think that this work done then connects to the notion of uh, basic income? Thank you. It is uh, mostly European uh, Union specific because uh, this, uh, in difference to all other world countries, uh, Europe countries don't have a a bank to print their money unless they all decide, uh, decide it together. Uh, do you think there is a way to tackle this for a short period until we take uh, ownership as a whole of the ECB? Thank you. There will be another round of uh, three questions. Uh, by the way, a second grave omission. Of course, this event is co-organized with uh, Papasotiriu Publishing, who published the book. So we are also thankful to them as well. Please. Okay, L let, me, let me focus on the first two questions. Um, I was thinking about them when the third question was being asked, so I apologize for that. I think an income cap is something that 
I wake up in the morning loving the idea, but I think it's quite difficult to impose. We at the moment are not able to tax income nearly effectively enough, tax havens and things. I have, think we have to focus on tax reform, to tax wealth and things that I was talking about. But I, I am open to the idea of certainly capping the income of the plutocrats and the, the elite. I want to respond in particular to your question, and thank you very much for it, because one's early work is, tends to get uh, forgotten, if you like. I wrote a series of books on labor markets and labor flexibility. And the essence of those, we're going back into the 1980s was I was saying that we now have flexible labor markets, open labor markets, where insecurities are multiplying. We cannot have the old form of welfare state. It won't work. It just will not work. Exclusion errors, means testing, poverty traps, all of these things are characteristic of a flexible open labor market. The precariat understand that. And that was one of the reasons why I believe that a basic income is consistent with the values of work and not the dictates of labor. And what I mean by that is that every form of work should have the same rights as any other form of work. Care work that we give to our children or our relatives or our community should have the, just the same rights as performing a job for a boss. They should have better rights if we can get that. And certainly that's why I've opposed laborism ever since those books. And it gives me a chance to add one thing and then I'll shut up, which is this. Every single pilot that I've been involved in doing and have been analyzing in the books, in every single pilot, people who have basic income work more, not less. I'll repeat it just in case you didn't understand, because people have a lot of prejudices about this. People who have a basic income work more, not less. But they tend to do different type of work. They tend to do more care work, more voluntary work, more community work, more reproductive work rather than resource depleting jobs. Isn't that what we want? It is a lie when people say that if you give people a basic income, they will become lazy. On the contrary, they will have more confidence, more energy, more dynamism, more sense of altruism. So if anyone says to you that it will make people lazy, that is a lie. And there is evidence from across the world to support it. Thank you very much. I shall answer the third question. Uh, the third question, let me just restate it, if, and, and correct me if I'm uh, misrepresenting you. In the Eurozone, our member states, our countries do not have printing presses. We do not control either our monetary policy or our fiscal policy. So uh, I suspect the question was, how do you envisage a basic income? Well, I will answer not on Guy's behalf, but on our behalf as Mera 25, as DM 25, uh, it was really very clear. Um, when the pandemic began, uh, we did a, a back of, the, of an envelope calculation, not a bad one though, uh, short but accurate. Uh, and we worked out that if um, the European Central Bank put 2,000 euros in every household's bank account across the Eurozone, it would cost them 750 billion. Uh, and then immediately, when I said that, um, I was chastised by, by you know, the usual suspects, the very serious people, as Krugman calls them, saying that this is preposterous and you know, the money tree has been discovered again. Now, by some fluke, by an accident of history, Christine Lagarde came out the next day. I mean, she probably didn't know what I had said, right? And she announced the printing of 750 billion, precisely down to the, to, 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 you know, to, to the last euro. But 
of quantitative easing. That money was going to go to the commercial banks, Deutsche Bank, Societe Generale, and so on, to, to go to the corporations to end up in the stock exchange. Um, so, yeah. now, how could it happen? You see, this is where I think technology really matters, and where the left must reappropriate Karl Marx's determination not to go back to a primitive state of being, but to appropriate on behalf of the many the technologies that capitalism spawns. One such technology, of course, is blockchain. Even though Bitcoin is a thoroughly regressive, awful idea for a currency, the blockchain, the technology, is one we could use. And I've got some news for you, in case you didn't know. They are already planning it in the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. Why? Because the Chinese Central Bank is planning it. The Chinese Central Bank is about to issue, they're already conducting experiments with blockchain technology to create a digital renminbi, a digital Chinese currency. And the ECB and the Fed and the Bank of England to deny the Chinese Central Bank this first mover advantage are already planning it. Now, why is this significant and how does this connect to universal basic income? It does because the moment you create a genuine distributed, decentralized central bank digital euro, it is to work, you know, for the system to work, it is as if everybody has a bank account with the central bank. At the moment, in Britain, in America, in, in, in the European Union, the central bank has, you know, opens bank accounts only to the big banks. Every big bank has an account with a central bank. You cannot have one. But in order to create the digital euro, the digital pound, the digital dollar, they will need to open bank accounts for everyone. Effective digital. Well, the immediate next step should be to credit a certain amount of these euros to every account that everybody already has. So there is an opportunity. There is no safe guarantee that we can work. But this is where, how we can come in and democratize money, creating serious chinks in the armor of capitalism by utilizing their crisis in order to grab the technologies that have been created through this capitalist process to turn it against them. There will be another round of uh, questions, of, of many to come. By the way, ένα σχόλιο για όσου ακούνε μέσω διερμηνεία. Ερωτήσει μπορούν να γίνουν και στα ελληνικά, βέβαια. Απλώ ή δυνατόν είναι μία πρόταση ώστε να μπορέσω επί τόπου να τη μεταφράσω και για του ομιλητέ. Για τον έναν δηλαδή που δεν μιλάει. Um, we are taking a, a next round of questions, a new round of questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I have to say, I found uh, Professor Standing's case for basic income sorry, very refreshing, uh, especially the fact that you pose it as a moral argument. One can hardly argue against it. And so I'm sorry, I'll have to bring it down again both my with both my questions to the level of existing politics and economics. So the first question is this. Uh, wouldn't this amount to a huge devaluation of labor? I mean, wouldn't this amount to a, 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 a huge supply of cheap labor for, for employers? Uh, and the second one, uh, it actually picks up from Yanis Varoufakis' last comment, uh, and it has to do with inflation. I know that we know that progressive economies don't think much of inflation because there are many ways to offset it. But in the case of Greece, we have a country with zero control over its currency and very limited control over its tax policy. So how can one offset the, the inflationary side effects of a, universal, of a UBI program? Thank you. Now, after too many men, we want to take some questions from uh, women as well, if possible. And, you know, just declaring a different uh, social gender will not cut it. Hello. I would like to ask how, um, who can control and who guarantees the quality of this universal basic income? And also, if we could open this idea further to a universal basic basic uh, education, etc., etc. Thank you very much. 
And our third question. Thank you. So I would like to ask first, uh, what about the scale? Would you be in favor of a local scale? Would you be in favor local in a city, in a province, in a country, or we should go EU zone or even globally? And the second one is, how would you reply to the feminist critique that if we implement the UBI actually, and I'm very sensitive to your emancipation claim, but that we can actually reverse some of the struggles of women's movements since much of our emancipation has come through work. Thank you. Please. For, um, for, how do you do this? This okay. is open, this is, this is on. Okay, four very different questions. Um, let me begin with the first. Cheap labor comes from people having no bargaining power. Cheap labor comes from people being so frightened about feeding their baby or paying their rent that they have to accept disgustingly low wages. A basic income strengthens people's bargaining power. If you have something in extremis, you can say F off to someone who offers some low wage. It strengthens your bargaining power. People who are really fearful don't join collective bodies and fight for their rights because they're too frightened. That's a normal human condition any of us would be like that. And let's not pretend otherwise. It actually strengthens the capacity to say no, and I want better. And that's what we need. So I don't believe that. I also saw it in action. In the pilots that we've done, people actually started demanding higher wages. If I'm going to do your dirty job, you better pay me. And we saw it in action. The second thing on inflation, I think that's one-handed economics. The biggest pilot that we did, we found that at the end of two years, unit prices of basic goods and services in those communities had gone down, not up, for a very simple economics thing. Demand increases supply. If you increase the demand by people who have low incomes, they spend it on basic goods and services, food, clothes, basic services, medical. And those things are produced locally. And it increases the supply. And the elasticity of supply is actually quite strong when it's thinking about the poor having improvements in their consumption power. As far as the third argument about basic education, there is a wonderful book written by the late Al Hirschman, a beautiful book where he describes how every progressive idea that he could think of, social policy and idea, each, every time it's proposed, people say, ah, oh, it will endanger other things. That's the objection made every time. And then when it's introduced, family benefits, I remember he had a long section on that. Once it's introduced, that objection goes away. Of course we need public education. Of course we need public health services. But there are a lot of things we don't need at the moment that are getting paid for, subsidies that go to the wealthy and corporates and so on. So I don't like this juxtaposition of two goods. It's a silly argument, and we shouldn't be taking it seriously. I'm not being impolite to the questioner. It's a perfectly valid question, but I think we can defeat it, and I have a section looking at Hirschman's arguments. The last question on local scale. I'm ambivalent in the sense that I often think that we will make most progress towards a basic income if we pose it as non-revolutionary. We pose it in a modest way. 
We're talking about giving people more freedom, more security, common justice. People in the middle classes buy that. If you sell it properly and you present it properly, they say, yeah, that's right, that's right. If we say that it's going to lead to the overthrow of capitalism, which I hope it will, we're going to lose 90% of the support of the salariat. So we have to be clever politically. I used to say this to John McDonnell when I was an economic advisor to him, and he supports basic income. I said, John, you've got to pose it as a moving down the road improving people's lives, using language that don't frighten people. And in that regard, I think local pilots are actually helping. Although I would be the first to say, yeah, bring it on for the whole country, the whole of Greece tomorrow. But I think pilots help. They help legitimize it. They accumulate the knowledge. They show examples. They show how the process could be introduced how people react and learn about it. So I'm in favor of pilots, even though I'm also in favor of bringing it on for the whole country and for every country. But I think we're getting both at the moment. Certain countries are moving much faster than I would have thought before the pandemic in the direction those who advocate basic income would have expected, and that's great. Thank you very much. Guy, like you, I also favored the gradualist approach of local pilot, but the pandemic has given us a great opportunity because the pandemic has created a big bank of basic income. I mean, furlough uh, in the United States. Donald Trump inaugurated you know, checks that arrived through the post in every, almost every uh, household. So, you know, capitalism has already created a big bang of universal basic income, and we must seize the moment, you know. Uh, a, a couple of comments, one concerning inflation. Uh, Guy answered it perfectly. Uh, but I just want to add another dimension. Those who have been cursed with an economics 101 education uh, have a tendency to take seriously the models that have been taught. Uh, it's in the nature of the beast. You know, you spend months and years learning something. You want to convince yourself that it is useful. It is not. It is pure, undiluted rubbish. Because all the assumptions that you need to make in order to come to the solutions that you need to come to in order to pass the, the course are wrong. One of the fundamental assumptions is that you have uh, prices equal cost. And therefore, that, you know, because competition has driven prices down to cost, therefore, if you throw money at the system somehow and you push costs up in one way or the other, that will drive prices up. But we live in a world where an iPhone trades for 1,300 American dollars and it costs 110 dollars. Let us not forget that the price cost margins that are being uh, imposed upon humanity are gigantic and in favor of the ultra wealthy. So the question is what effect will UBI have on the capacity of the wealthy to extract rents of rentier, rentier capitalism, as Guy says, right? So take this into consideration. Uh, and finally, when it comes to the question of how to sell universal basic income. I do believe that we need to be transparent. I do not believe that we should lie to people or you know, be economical with the truth. This is where, you know, in my old age, I didn't used to believe that, I've changed my mind in recent years. I think we should be clear with, with them. I think the, the majority out there are ready to accept the fact that capitalism is bunk. It, it had, its, this, it had the same moment in 2008 that socialism had in 1991. All its illusions have been overthrown and overturned. It is no longer 
being driven by profitability. It is no longer driven by market competition. It is driven by the capacity of the oligarchy to utilize the printing presses of the central banks in their favor through the financial markets. And you have this increasing expansion of platforms that behave like techno fiefdoms and not like markets anymore, whether it's Amazon.com and so on and so forth. And people out there are ready to accept a narrative which is cautious, speaks their language, but at the same time gives them the, 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 this notion that the next step down the road is also the first step to a major transformation. They feel it in their bones that there is a transformation happening, whether we are radical as the left or not. The question is, is this going to be a transformation that would lead to extinction, as Guy said, or maybe to redemption? A theological, a theological topic. <laughs> uh, thankfully, due to the brevity of the questions, and we are very grateful for that, we have time for not, not only one more round, but many more. Who would like to ask, to pose a question? We still feel a great disturbance in the gender balance, so we would like to remedy that. Well, although we create that imbalance by being... <laughs> to related questions, uh, can you be implementing the term of commodities instead of money? And uh, a, a related one, if uh, UBI can, can be seen as uh, a commons, uh, it should be uh, regulated by whom and if there is a need to, to be regulated or it should be used uh, as something in, more, in a more free form uh, currency. Could you repeat the very first part of the question, please? Because it was while the microphone was en route. Yeah. Uh, if the UBI can be implemented in terms of commodities, commodities. Uh, in, instead of uh, money, if you can uh, say it that uh, every people Absolutely. would like... Uh, 100 tomatoes, 300 potatoes, etc. Thank you. A second question. We are very thankful to our courageous Kostas Raptis for making the microphone fly. Um, my question is, um, which country do you think is most likely to introduce uh, UBI first? <laughs> And is there a, a first mover effect so that if there is a move towards one country introducing it, would other countries be forced to, to rush to do the same? And a third one. Okay, regardless of gender balance, one by me. <laughs> uh, what about the citizen-non-citizen -citizen divide? The citizen-non-citizen -citizen divide that is delimiting the group of UBI beneficiaries in an era of huge and frequent population moves. Please. Okay, another round of good questions. Um, there's a big debate in Britain at the moment between the social democrats who are coming up proposing universal basic services instead of universal basic income. I never use the term universal basic income, even though people say I'm an advocate of universal basic income. I'm an advocate of basic income. And I think that however much we would like it to be universal for everybody to be given the same basic income, we have to start within our own communities and within our own countries. And that means in the answer to the, the, the third question, that you're going to have to have a pragmatic rule about who qualifies to receive the basic income. If you introduced in Britain or in Greece a basic income for everybody, and it happens to be much higher than the level of incomes in an African country, you're going to get a flood of people wanting to come to Greece. And politically, it's going to be impossible for us to get support from the ordinary electorate, be it in Britain 
or in Greece. For me, that means you're going to have to say that it would only apply for legal, usual residents of the country. That doesn't mean that you say, don't give the migrants anything. On the contrary, that subject should be treated separately. We need to give far more help to migrants and refugees than is being done at the moment. But it's got to be treated separately from the basic income. And that, I think, is vital. But to go back to the first question, as someone on the left, I don't believe in paternalism. I don't believe in state paternalism any more than patriarchal paternalism. I don't believe that as a position that should be taken by the left. I don't know what you need. Only you need know what you need. Even you may not know. But somebody who believes in giving food parcels or this or that is basically saying, I know what you need better than you do. And I'm sorry, but that's not a position that I, as someone on the left, can accept. I don't believe in paternalism. And when you get to ideas of universal basic services, you always have a problem which services are basic. Which? We're going to give out free food to everybody? I saw that in the Soviet Union when I worked there. It was a disaster. Are we going to say we fund free bus services, but not free metro tube services? What about the people who take bicycles, etc.? Always it gets to questions of the state deciding what's good for you. And I don't like that. And I think, therefore, we should be suspect. But it doesn't mean we don't believe in good public services. Of course we should have good public services. And the last question, you'll be, you'll be uh, not surprised that I've been asked it a thousand times. And probably my answer has varied a thousand times. Right now, I believe that there is a strong probability that the Republic of Korea, South Korea, could introduce it next year. The leading presidential candidate has come to our various meetings. He's a lovely man, and he's leading in the opinion polls, and he's introduced a sort of basic income in his province where he's governor. So all the young people get a basic income in his province, and it's so popular. And the movement in South Korea that I had the privilege of beginning 20 years ago is incredibly powerful. They are fabulous people, fabulous. So at the moment, my, my tip is that sometimes it's been Canada, sometimes it's been an African country. South Africa couldn't nearly have introduced it recently, but they lost their nerve at the last moment. So we don't know where it came, but I do believe it will be a threshold that once one significant country introduces it, a whole lot of countries will follow. And that's a wonderful thought. So thank you very much. Just like Guy, I also think that the idea of basic services is a truly bad idea because it's absolutely patronizing. It's like saying, you know, I'll give you some food, a basket of you know, groceries, and uh, I will decide what it will contain. Uh, who am I to decide that? Money is power, and always will be power, as long as we do not have Star Trek replicators. Now, for those of you who are not Trekkies, ignore it. The other issue concerning the scope, who gets it? Uh, do the metics get it? Remember in ancient Athens, the metics didn't get the vote, right? Uh, or not. I understand your point, Guy, that we need to be pragmatic and we need to say something that people will actually respond posi positively to, even if they don't share our philosophy and ideology. And the, the fear of the other, of the foreigner who is going to be magnetized by a basic income to our country, uh, is very strong and, of course, neo-fascists and the right and 
other misanthropes uh, weaponize against us and against the idea of Beijing. I understand that entirely, but I'm not totally convinced that by saying that registered residents will get it, others will not get it, because you know, I can immediately hear what my, our opponents in Parliament are going to say. They're going to say that, well, that makes it even more p pertinent to Nigerians, to Ghanese people to come here in order to establish themselves eventually as registered residents and therefore get. So I don't think it gets us out of the issue. And the issue is a very time honored one. It's a question of socialism in one country, right? I mean, <laughs> and I don't have the answer to that. So I'm not going to, to come up with a proposal, but it is something that we should seriously worry about. It's not a reason not to do it, uh, it's a reason to think much, much harder. Um, about it. Uh, and finally, regarding the, you know, where is it going to emerge, to take place? Well, we don't know really. I mean, I hope it happens in Korea, but, you know, the beauty about the course of history is its indeterminacy. You never know when it's going to hit you. In the same way that it was impossible to predict that the Industrial Revolution would take place in England as opposed to Germany, as opposed to Italy for that matter. Uh, it's an, an idea that is going to be implemented at some point, somewhere. So our job is not to sit back and uh, predict. Our job is to get out there and try to make it happen. Well, of course, if Yanis gets the majority in the elections, Greece will be the first country. <laughs> so, a new round of questions, please. Any takers? Hi, um, Professor Gaetstanding, um, Professor Varoufakis, it was a lovely evening, and thank you very much for this pleasant presentation. Um, it was really enjoyed. Um, I have a direct question to you. Um, I'm an economist, too, and many of my colleagues ask me that if we introduce the basic income in our country, um, that would have a, a negative effect on our current account. You know, Greece has a long-lasting historical uh, problem with its current account deficit. So I would just want to hear what is your opinion on this matter. Thank you. Γεια σας. Θα θέσω και ένα ερώτημα στα ελληνικά, έτσι, για αλλαγή. Ε, ήθελα να ρωτήσω, υπάρχουν κάποιες εξαιρέσεις, ε, ας πούμε ότι το βασικό εισόδημα δεν θα το λαμβάνουν οι πολύ πλούσιοι. Are there any exceptions to universal basic income that it shouldn't be uh, received by the ultra-rich? Συνεχίστε. Ή είναι καθολικό, ας πούμε, οποιοςδήποτε Since ανήκει σε ένα κράτος. Since you mentioned the difference between universal basic income and basic income, what would be that difference in particular? Καλά το λέω. And a third question, please. Uh, concerning the uh, citizen no citizen divide, over the last few years in Europe, there has been an implementation of the basic income in parts of the migrant population. Have you guys uh, researched the results of this implementation at all? I know that now it's in the uh, phase out uh, process, which is very disappointing. Uh, also, uh, I believe that um, what Yanis was saying, in order to um, implement the universal basic income in Europe, we should not be considering citizen, not citizen status. It should be universal. It's not draining anything from the citizens if non-citizens, migrants, are also getting this uh, basic income. Uh, but coming to my question again, have you done any research on uh, the implementation of this uh, experiment in Europe with the uh, migrant population or parts of the migrant population over the last few years. Thank you. And a very last question. So I'm going to ask about the beast, uh, as Mr. Yanis Varfakis asked. Uh, can it be modeled, the actual uh, universal basic income? And I think you are the most appropriate person to ask because I've searched for meta-analysis. There aren't any. Should there be any? Can it be modeled because you need to persuade the status quo? Should, should it be what? Modeled. Modeled. Oh, okay. Yep, that's the question. 
can I answer, can I answer that very quickly, uh, in, in, in a rather brief manner? No. The reason being that in order to close your models, you need to make assumptions that take you into the realm that has absolutely nothing to do with really existing capitalism. The only way to close our models, I'll repeat this once more, is by making them irrelevant to the circumstances in which we live. You can create a model, but if you, if you try to solve it, you've made yourself not only irrelevant, but also very dangerous to society. Please. Okay, let me add to what Yanis just said on modeling. As, as I discuss in the book, a number of uh, people, economists, have tried simulation modeling and they build a castle of assumptions and they feed in the extra basic income and they can show this and that. I don't think those exercises are totally useless, but I do object when people draw strong conclusions from them. They actually do start raising questions about, well, if you do have a basic income, well, what will be the effect on health? Will there be a feedback effect on public services? Will there be this effect, that effect? You can start thinking of flow connections. Useful. Where I object is that they put in this stuff, that they don't reveal the full assumptions. The models are, are very misleading. And, and basically, with general equilibrium, they're, they're totally dishonest. They're dishonest because they presume a type of economy that has never existed, never could exist, and yet they make it into a model. That, that is fundamentally dishonest. So uh, enough on that, perhaps. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood the first question, so I apologize in, in advance for my, my answer. But it's going to get back to the fundamentals of what we're talking about. The greatest economist of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, made the comment which many Keynesians and social democrats don't like to remember. He said, anything we really want, we can afford. That's John Maynard Keynes, okay? And I believe that that is the case. If we want to construct a different type of society and economy and a different way of interacting with nature, with the lessons we've learned from the sixth pandemic this century, we can do it. But it's a matter of political struggle and political will. So the, my answer to, to you is we have to find the vocabulary. We have to find the visions, the imagination that gets people instead of opting out of politics, getting energized and coming back into politics. That's the answer. And I believe basic income is part of that agenda. And that's why the precariat are enthused. The question about should a very rich man have it as well as a poor reminded me of one of the pilots we did where when we were just doing the launch, where we were telling people how they could receive their basic income, a man in a four by four, a huge uh, new Range Rover or whatever it was, came into the community and he came up to me, he was a big man, big landowner. And he came up and he said, look, can you explain? Why are you giving it to me? I don't need it. I don't need it. Why are you giving it to me? And I said, are you a member of this community? If you are a member of this community, everybody in the community has the entitlement to this right. It's a right. You should pay your taxes. You should be treating social services, etc. But this is your right. And ironically, I saw him about six months afterwards when he'd been receiving his basic income, which he didn't need. He was most enthusiastically supporting the basic income. And do you know why? 
The reason he told me, he said, look, I can see how it's strengthening our community, how it's making everybody feel more altruistic, more members of this community. I see people smiling. I see people being generous. I see people not stealing other people's crops. I support it. And I believe that Thomas Paine had the same sort of argument. This is a right. Yes, tax from the rich. Yes, hit them, stop them looting the commons, etc. That's a separate problem. But a basic income is a basic economic right. And we have to be consistent with that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. Dear Yanis, any concluding words? Just a huge thank you to Guy Standing for being here today, to Satiris, to the organizers of META, to the Numismatic Museum, to all of you for making this possible. On behalf of META, the Center for Post Capital Civilization, uh, on behalf of Papa Sotiriu Publishing, on behalf of the Numismatic Museum, who is, which is also co organizing this event, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you, Guy and Yanis. Sorry? Yes, of course. Uh, there will be book signing. Books shall be signed. You can procure the book uh, from there. But please do not exhaust our author. The movement needs him. Good night and thank you very much.